Okay, so 401ks and IRAs, what are they all about? What's the difference? Why does it matter, et cetera? So just a quick primer on the difference. And does anyone have a 403b? So it's really, it's the same thing. It's for nonprofits instead of for profits. But it's, when I talk about 401k, I mean a 403b also. So the first difference is your employer sponsors the 401k. You sponsor an IRA. Your employer has nothing to do with an IRA. They work very, very similarly. They're the same idea. A Roth, which I'll talk more about in a moment. It's an after-tax version. I'll talk more about it. Not all 401ks offer them. More and more they do. It's a new option. So for smaller, older companies, sometimes they don't. An IRA, um, you always have the option for a Roth in an IRA. And then there's something called a SEP IRA, which is, stands for Self-Employment Plan. SEP IRAs do not have a Roth option, which is not well known. So uh, a Roth is a great thing, and I'll talk more about it in, in a moment. But you're probably familiar with this. Um, I'm guessing, well, I'm not going to make any assumptions, but if you're over 50, you can contribute up to 25000 in a 401k and an extra 1000 in an IRA. The way a SEP works, is anybody self-employed in the room? Then I don't need to talk, talk about a SEP. It's just if you're self-employed. But the, the, the limits are much, much higher for, for a SEP. And with an IRA, you're limited to if you can contribute to it based on your income. That's not true with a 401k. Anybody in the company, no matter how highly paid you are, can contribute to a 401k. If your income's over a certain amount, it's different if you're married, it's different if it's a Roth or regular, you cannot contribute to an IRA. So for example, if you work for a company and you can, let's say you contribute to the 401k and you max out, mm -hmm. you can also contribute to an IRA if you wanted to save more if your income is lower than a certain amount. Okay. But if it's higher, you, you can't. The basic philosophy behind this with the government, there's a certain logic to it, which is they don't want these benefits, which are valuable, just to accrue to, to the wealthy in society. They want to incent everybody to save for retirement, but they don't want all the benefits to go for the wealthy. That's why these caps are there. RMDs, you may have heard the acronym, you may not. If you're over the age of 70, you're almost certainly aware of this. Or if you have an inherited IRA and you're younger than 70, you're aware of it. RMDs, the basic, the basic notion of a, a, a pre-tax, a traditional 401k or an IRA, is that you got a tax benefit when you contributed the money, you paid no tax, and the government wants their money eventually, and they're going to get it. And the way they get it is they impose these RMDs in the year you turn 70 and a half. They don't make anything easy. It's way more complicated. I don't know why it's 70 and a half and not 70, but that's the way they do, do things in the government. So the IRS knows eventually they're going to get their money. It may be when you, after you turn 70, maybe after you die and it's inherited by somebody else and they're going to have to pay RMDs, et cetera. But they're going to eventually get their money. So the first thing to realize and I'll talk more about this in a second, is when you have a traditional IRA or 401k, it overstates your actual wealth because you're just holding some of that for the government. So if you have $100 in an IRA and your marginal tax rate is 25% and you live in the state of Mass and it's another 5%, you're never going to get more than 70% of that money, $70, $70 out of the 100. So you think you have $100 of wealth saved up, but you really only have 70. The other 30 you're holding for the state of Mass and the IRS. Does everybody follow? So that's important to be aware of. So when I work with clients and I'm looking at their net worth and their balance sheet, I ratchet back the traditional retirement assets because they're just not worth as much as they appear on paper. You think you have the money, but you're going to pay tax on it. So how do you pay tax? Starting when you're 70 and a half, you have to take distributions from the account at a rate that I'll talk about in a second. And then you have to, that's treated as income. You're going to get a 1099. So if you have your IRA, Fidelity, or Vanguard, wherever, they're going to issue you a 1099. You can, you can withhold the tax when you take that money out. The amount that you 
have to take out, the percentage goes up every year based on your life expectancy. If you're wondering, it starts at about 4% when you're 70 and it slowly goes up after that. So that's, so they make sure they get their money, their taxes. You can always take more if you're wondering. For a variety of reasons, you probably don't want to. I'll talk more about that in a minute, unless you need the money to live on. So is everybody clear how that works? So if you're curious, this is, this is the table that is used to determine. I, I didn't put in every year, but if you want to get a sense of how it goes up. So if you make it to age 100, you have to withdraw 16% each year. Again, it's based on the life expectancy, and the life expectancy table that they use is a little bit, it's, it's uh, generous to the taxpayer. It's, it's based on a long, because I think it's based on a married couple is how, is how they actually do it. So in other words, when you're, this, this thing they call the distribution period, it's another weird name for it. It's really just a life expectancy. So when you're 70, your life expectancy is not another 20, 27 years. It's probably, I don't know, 18 years or so. But, but they're giving you more time. And the way they calculate this percentage, if you're wondering, if you're a math person, it's one over that number. That's the way it's done. When you die, you have a beneficiary who is de designating your IRA. So your ben beneficiary will get a gift, which is an inherited IRA. And the withdrawals work differently for an inherited IRA. Um, so let's say your kid inherits it and your kid is young. They don't have the option of waiting until age 70. They have to start taking withdrawals immediately when they inherit it, but it's based on their life expectancy. So the withdrawals are very, very small. So it becomes an inherited IRA and has to be titled in a certain way. So the plan administrator, so Fidelity knows it's inherited. They base it on your age. And then you have to start taking the money out again. The IRS is going to get their money eventually from that IRA. OK, so a few tips <clears throat> about your hygiene for your retirement accounts. So here's some advice I, I like to give ev everybody. When you retire, but certainly before age 70 and a half, when you have to begin the RMDs, I recommend you consolidate all your 401ks into one or two IRAs, depending on whether you have a Roth. And the term that's used is, is a rollover. You may have heard that term. I have clients who come to me with a manila folder full of old 401ks. They worked at six places over their lifetime. They uh, left them there when they left the employment, and now they got six 401ks and they got a couple IRAs from who, who knows where. And my advice is every time you leave an employer, roll over your 401k into an IRA for a variety of reasons. Um, and as you go through life, so what I have for me, for example, which is what I recommend, I have two IRAs. I have a Roth IRA and a, and a pre-tax, a traditional IRA. Every time I left an employer, I rolled the 401k, which in my case was always a pre-tax one, into the same IRA. So you don't need multiple rollover IRAs. You just need one. You need one for, one for pre-tax, as I'll call it, and one for Roth. Everybody follow? So I have three accounts at Vanguard. That's where my money is. I have a pre-tax IRA, I have a Roth IRA, and I have a taxable bro brokerage account where the rest of my savings are. And again, so when I turn 70 and a half, I just have one place from which I need to get the RMDs. Everybody follow? There's other reasons to do it, and, and Roger, you raised this earlier. A lot of 401ks are lousy. The fees are high. MIT is not a lousy one, by the way. MIT is a great 401k. But a lot of people, particularly a smaller company, the fees are high, the investment options are poor. So if you roll out of that 401k and you choose your own IRA, you can get much better investment options and lower, lower fees. I recommend everybody use Vanguard, but Fidelity is OK also. So that's the second point. You want to be mindful. Fees really matter. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Fees really matter, particularly over a lifetime of investing. So you want to be mindful about selecting both low-cost funds and a low-cost administrator, you know, Fidelity or Vanguard. In a retirement account, you get to designate the 
beneficiary you have, you should always update that with who you want because that's going to make it easy for them when, when you are gone. Um, I recommend after you turn 70, 70 and a half, you should automate the RMDs so the, the financial firm can take care of that. They know how old you are. They know what the rate is. It's based on the value of the account on December 31st of the prior year. I recommend you take a lump sum amount. You take the whole year's worth in January, and you have them withhold the tax, and then you're done for the year. That's the easiest way to do it. So for example, when I turn 70 and a half, my IRA's at Vanguard, and I have a taxable account. <clears throat> I'm just going to tell Vanguard to take my full year's RMD, withhold the tax, and put it into my Vanguard account right next door. And then I don't have to worry about it. It's the easiest way to do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get it every month. I don't think there's any reason to get a check every month. Just get the full year and put it in your other account. And withhold the tax so you don't get a bad surprise. The taxes are better outside of it. When it, when it appreciates in an IRA, you pay regular income tax rates. If it were to appreciate outside the IRA, you would pay capital gains rates on that appreciation. And capital gains rates are lower than regular, ordinary income rates. So in essence, you want to get it out as fast as you can, not as slowly as you can. So if you get any advice to wait to the end of the year, I think that's bad advice. I would do it on January 2nd. It's not a big deal. The difference on one year's appreciation and the difference between the two tax rates is small. But when it comes to this stuff and going through life, the way you're going to build your net worth most optimally is lots of small improvements that save a little bit of money here and there. It's not, there, there are no great secrets of huge ways to generate wealth that you don't know about. It's doing lots of small things right. And that's, that's an example of one. Okay, and then the last thing is, now let's talk about Roth IRAs. So, does everybody know what a Roth IRA is, what the dif difference is? Let me give you a brief explanation. So a regular IRA, regular 401k, when you contribute the money, you get a tax deduction that year. So you, you're, you pay less tax. You, you declare less income in the year you, you, you put the money in. It accrues tax deferred for many years, but now, you know, now we all regret doing it when we're 70 because when you withdraw it, you're going to pay tax on everything. And even worse than that, you're going to pay ordinary income tax. Not, so a lot of the growth of your account is capital gains. But you're going to pay ordinary income tax on everything you pull out because you never pay tax on it. A Roth is the opposite. When you contribute the money, Roth 401k or Roth IRA, you get no tax benefit at the time. It's so-called after-tax money. It will, it will compound and grow tax-free. And when you withdraw the money, it's tax-free forever. You're never going to pay tax on that money. A Roth IRA, just as an aside, it's the best gift to inherit if you're thinking about your heirs. There's nothing better. No, nothing says I love you more than somebody left you a Roth IRA because they're not going to pay any tax on it either. So that's the difference. So let's, let's talk about a few things. So a conversion is, a, is an IRS term. You can convert a pre-tax IRA to a Roth whenever you want. Anytime, no income limitations, as much as you want. Mm -hmm. When you convert, you pay tax on the money you distributed from the pre-tax into the Roth. So it's a taxable event, but the government allows you to shelter it into a Roth. So it's a great thing to do under certain cir circumstances. So that's what, everybody understand what a conversion is? You take the money from your pre-tax IRA yeah. and you do what's called a uh, conversion. And Fidelity or Vanguard will automate this for you. You tell them it's a conversion. And they put the money into a Roth IRA. On the way there, they're going to issue a 1099 and you're going to pay ordinary income tax on the amount you converted. It's as if you took the money out of your regular IRA. Everybody follow? So why might you want to do that? If you find yourself in a low tax bracket at a particular time, when you think your tax bracket might be higher later, it's a great thing to do. So for example, for, for me, and this might be true for other people in the room, um, I used to work full time. I don't now. Um, so my income is relatively low now. 
And when I turn 70, I'm going to be collecting Social Security and I'm going to be taking money from my IRA. So my income is going to go up. So for these years between now, I'm about to turn 62, between now and 70, I'm going to convert some of my IRA to a Roth every year to fill up the tax bracket below which I think I'll be when I'm 70. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? So I'm not going to do a, a lot because then my, I'll pay high tax now. But my income is relatively low now. And by doing this, I reduce the amount of money in my traditional IRA. So when I turn 70, the RMDs I have to take are smaller. Because when I turn 70, my income's going up. I'm going to have the RMDs and I'm going to have a social security check. Does everybody follow? So it's a good thing to do during a period when your income is low and you expect it might be a little higher later. How much can you do? Is there a limit? Unlimited amount because you're going to pay tax on it. You, could do your, you wouldn't want to do hundreds of thousands of dollars because you're going to pay your marginal tax rate's going to go up. Well, you kind of take a guess at, so in my case, I say, so what's my tax rate going to be when I turn 70? So let's just say I think my marginal tax rate is going to be 24% when I turn 70. Mm -hmm. So I would do enough now to fill up the 22% tax bracket and maybe the 24, because there's other benefits to a Roth also that are smaller. So I wouldn't do more than would get me above a 24% tax bracket. Plus, if you think tax rates are going to change in the future and if you think they're going to go up, then you know that's another reason you might. But I wouldn't convert a million dollars at one time, because that's going to put you in a very high tax bracket now. When you open up a Roth, uh, it's five years before you can, I believe it's five years before you can take the earnings out, but the amount you contributed, you can take out without penalty. And I think once you turn 70, I don't think those rules apply. I'm not certain, I'd have to look that up. Mm -hmm. But when you're young, so like when my kids were young, I had them do Roth IRAs when they were teenagers and they earned some income. That, once you have earned income, when you're young and you have earned income, you're a teenager, you work at a restaurant or whatever, mm -hmm. there's nothing better than a Roth IRA because um, they're not going to pay tax. A pre-tax IRA is worth nothing to them because they're not going to pay any tax anyway because their income's low. So that money's sheltered forever and their five-year clock has started. Not that it's a big, big deal. A backdoor Roth, so-called backdoor Roth, it's comp complicated. It's a way to, there's a income limitation of how much you can earn to contribute to a Roth each year. There's a special kind of IRA, a so-called non-deductible IRA, where there's no income limit. It's not a great deal. You can contribute to an IRA, you don't get a tax deduction, but the money grows tax deferred. So the so-called backdoor IRA is when you contribute to a non-deductible IRA. You don't get a tax deduction and then you do a conversion to a Roth the next day. And then spending order is, is a question I often get. If you have, there's usually three bu buckets of savings. Your, uh, your, you know, the ta taxable money you've saved up, maybe a Roth and a pre-tax. So what's the best order in which to spend down? My advice is if you have flexibility from which bucket to draw the money, depending on how much money you have, I would never take more than the minimum RMD out of the pre-tax. There's no reason to. You're just going to pay extra tax. And if you have the resources, um, if you take any extra, I would do it as a Roth conversion because you're going to pay tax anyway, so you might as well convert it into a Roth. So the basic reasoning I have is take the minimum RMD out of your pre-tax every year. Don't take any more if you can afford not to. Spend down your taxable savings next, subject to any capital gains that you may face, depending on where this money's invested. So if, it, if you're going to pay capital gains tax, then you may want to wait. And you may want to time the capital gains, as we talked a little bit about, for you know, figure out the years in which your income is low and you would take more capital gains then. So you almost have a trade-off. Do I realize capital gains or do I convert to a Roth? You probably don't want to do both in the same year because they're both going to raise your tax bracket. And the Roth, I would spend last because that's the most valuable money. It's sheltered forever. So as soon as you take it out, it's not sheltered anymore. Okay, so I think 
probably a lot of you have these questions here, spending strategies in, in uh, retirement. So the first is, <clears throat> you often hear about this 4% rule of thumb. Have people heard this? So it's like a lot of heuristics, a lot of rules of thumb, which is, it's, it's not precisely correct, but it's not terribly wrong either. The problem with it is, first, it's unclear what it means. So what does that mean? You take, when you turn 65, you take 4% 4 and you take that same amount every year? Or does it mean you take 4% each year? You look and see what's there, you take 4%, you see what the balance is on January 1st? Or do you take 4% and increase it by the rate of inflation every year? It's not clear what it means, first of all. But in terms of your brain's thinking about how much spending power do I have, 4% is not a terrible place to start. But the part of the issue is it depends how old you are. So a 4% rule of thumb when you're 50 doesn't work as well as a 4% rule of thumb when you're 80. They're different. When you're 80, you can spend a lot more than 4%. You're not going to live that long. So 4% 4 if you had no growth is going to last you 25 years. And that's assuming your balance didn't grow at all. So when you're 80, you can spend more than 4%. Everybody follow the thinking? When you're 50, I probably wouldn't spend. I would spend less than 4%. You're not going to make it. Your life expectancy is very, very long. So it's a rule of thumb that's very common. And if you're 65, it's not a terrible place to start to think, based on my net worth, based on my assets, what can I spend per year? It's not a bad rule, but it also depends where is your money. Is it in a pre-tax IRA? Well, you don't actually have as much as you think you have. Is it in a Roth? You know, you got more. Is it tied up in stocks from 50 years ago where the capital gains are high? It, it depends on a lot of things. But as a start, I don't think it's a terrible place depending on your age and all those things I mentioned. The way I guide people is if it's the house you live in, I tend not to include it. Because if you don't live there, you're going to pay rent somewhere else. If it's secondary real estate, I would include it. So if you, if you own a second home on the Cape, I would include that value. Because you can sell that if you had to and use that money. But if you're the house you live in, if you want to include, then your spending is going to change if you move out of it. So is that clear? Yes. OK. It's very hard. If you're struggling with this, you're not the only. It's very hard to figure out spending in retirement, because the ultimate problem is this last bullet. You don't know when you're going to die, right? There's no that uh, you can do annuities, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the pluses and minuses of them. But the challenge is, we're all nervous about how much to spend. We'd rather not die with too much money in the bank, because we'd like to enjoy our life, but we don't want to run out of money. And that's a very hard problem to solve. And that either you need to take some risk or you need to transfer that risk to somebody else. And you're going to pay to transfer that risk. That's what an annuity is. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But if you want absolute certainty that uh, you're not going to run out of money uh, and you're not going to die with too much money in the bank, I can't guarantee that. But some guidelines are. I would encourage you when you go into retirement to start tracking your monthly spending. And I don't mean every category. How much do we spend on restaurants and movies and travel? Don't bother with that to start. If you think you're financially reasonably well off, you don't need that level of detail. <clears throat> but you should have a good handle on what do you spend every month, because that'll help inform you on whether you think you're in good shape or not. And the way I advise people to do that, it's very, very simple. We all spend money a few ways. Some of us you know, um, use debit, use credit, online bill payment. Some people go to the ATM. Some people never go to the ATM. I would just add up all your sources of spending every month, debit, credit, uh, your bank statement. Sometimes you just need your bank statement because it captures everything. You pay your credit card through it. It captures the ATM withdrawals. And just have a simple spreadsheet. And if you're not a spreadsheet person, a, a, a pad of paper is fine. And just write down the total every month. And just track it. Because it, we all know this. We've all been around. It's going to change every month. There's variability. There's seasonality. 
I pay my car insurance bill in one lump sum to save a few bucks. So that month, you know, I have a big bill, et cetera. So track it every month for a while, for at least a year. And that should give you either comfort or, you know, a yellow flag. A comfort that you're fine or a yellow flag that you need to you need to look a little further, you need to cut back or not. And I think just that information will help you a lot. So track your spending, don't get too anal about it, don't worry about how much you're spending on restaurants right now. You can worry about that later if you have a problem. There's a good chance you won't have a problem. And you have, you know, you, you've all been around a lot, you've had a life, you know how to manage your money, but you want to get a sense of what's going out the door and what's going in in terms of your income. What some financial planners advise, and I don't think this is terrible advice, is to the extent you can sort out what's your discretionary spending versus your mandatory spending. That can be helpful, particularly in terms of figuring out how you want to invest your funds, which I'll talk more about. So, so the notion is, some level, some percentage of your spending is mandatory, and you'll define that how you want. But it certainly, you know, is, you know, food, shelter, tra transportation, et cetera, um, pre presents for the kids and grandkids, et cetera. And some is uh, discretionary. You know, travel might be an example of that. And get a sense in your mind roughly how that breaks down. And the reason to do that is you may want to divide your assets into what I call at-risk versus guaranteed income. So guaranteed income are things like Social Security, pension, and an annuity if you were to do that. And you could argue that um, very safe short-term bonds and money market funds and CDs would be, I would treat that as guaranteed income. I think that's very, very safe. And do you have enough assets to generate enough guaranteed income to cover the mandatory spending you have? Does everybody follow? And then the at-risk um, assets, the investments you make, investing in the stock market really is what I'm talking about, uh, that would cover the uh, discretionary spending. So that's another way to you know, really to assuage your mental health around this because it drives everybody crazy trying to figure this out. And, you know, some of us are going to die with way too much money in the bank and wish we had spent more, but, you know, you, you're, you're worried. And so that's one way, I think, to give you a, a little bit more calm about how you are doing about this. Because, and I'll talk more about this later also, you don't want to invest too conservatively. Because if you invest too conservatively, you're going to run into trouble if you live a long life and you haven't generated the kinds of returns that, that you want.